Hello, and welcome again to a long overdue episode of Row Rights, number three, The Vault. This will be the third entry into this franchise on the story, The Vault. Today, we're going to be talking about the structure of this short story. We're going to call this structure the handoff. We'll talk about why I'm using that terminology as the video goes along. So recently, the Mechanics Channel had a bump in viewership. And I think most of that bump in viewership is sort of organic from the algorithm and came from people who are interested in fiction writing videos. So many of the folks in that audience, and this might be you, may not be familiar with my other channel where I publish my fiction writing as audiobooks. Uh, that channel is just the P.E. Row YouTube channel, at Rowlit. So for those of you who are, please bear with me for like a minute while I explain what Row Rights is all about. This series is going to be a little different from the proper mechanics lectures, where we simply talk about the structures and facets of fiction writing uh, in a matter-of-fact way. Here we're talking more about the application of them. And I use my own stories for two reasons, uh, and one of them is not to promote or suggest that my stories are magnificent in any way. Uh, it's just that A, I own the copyright, and so I don't have to get into any issues of permission or you said this about my story or, or whatever. The other reason is that I may have some idea of what the author was thinking when they were writing the story. So those are the two main reasons that I'm using my own fiction when we're talking about application. And most of the time during this series, just because I feel like there's a gap out there in constructive ways to talk about plot, I'm generally going to be talking about plot here until somebody tells me, stop talking about plot. So here we go. We're talking about a story called The Vault, which I wrote as an audience selected topic. It won the poll for the topic of AI and cognitive decline. I think this was April or May of 2023. The story's done really well relative to other stories on the channel. I think it's the third most popular story on the channel. If you haven't listened to it yet or read it yet, I will have a Substack link for the text in the description and a video link as well for those of you who want to listen and a podcast link for anyone who, who might like to download the story. So I mentioned at the outset the structure of this thing. We're going to call it the handoff. And let's talk really quickly about st story structure in general, specifically the structure of a novel versus a short story. So a novel structure, uh, and we might call this the simple ideal, the image or metaphor that I like to use is of a juggler with many balls in the air. And then at the start of the novel, the juggler is going to throw one of these balls way up in the air. And that's going to be the, the global plot, the sort of thing that's in the back of the reader's mind as the rest of the story is going along. And you'll have these subplots, sort of the balls that are in the juggler's hand at the moment, while that other ball is way up in the air and the reader's thinking like, you know, what's going to happen when that one that's way up in the air comes down? The exemplar I, I like to give there because it's so good is the Odyssey, where the story begins with Odysseus deciding that he wants to go home and thus begins the quest. And then you have these smaller subplots within it where he deals with the Lotus Eaters and the Sirens and the Cyclops. And all of those are self-contained little plots where the reader can process what's going on with respect to what's going on at the moment, but they're also thinking of that ball that's way up in the air, the global plot that Odysseus wants to get home to Penelope. So that's sort of a simple ideal of a novel plot. And I begin there because we're gonna put that in relief with the structure of a short story. And short stories generally don't have the physical space, time, bandwidth, all of that to incorporate a full, simple ideal of a novel with that sort of global plot and then multiple subplots underneath. It would just be really hard to pull that off in a short story if you're fully fleshing out these subplots with any sort of depth. In the lessons that would cover this that we're talking about now would be lessons number nine and ten, a plot or not, grammatical stories is lesson nine, 
and then the plot thickens because of course it does that's lesson number 10 uh, and lesson number 10 would be the one where we're talking about the plot of a novel versus the plot of a short story so that's the sort of simple ideal of a novel plot and the and i would say there is a simple ideal of a short story structure where you're dealing with one primary plot element which we mean an introduced plot element that acts as a suspense cue, constraints on that introduced plot element, and then a resolution. So there are a lot, a lot of great short stories with this structure of a single magnetic plot element being fleshed out in that manner. I'll give a couple examples of some of my favorites. Edgar Allan Poe's Cask of Amontillado, where the main plot element is revenge. Uh, Rick Bass's short story, Fires, is a romance or sex plot. John Cheever's Country Husband, uh, that kind of dances into the realm with some subplot elements, but really it's about transgression. Philip Roth's magnificent short story, Defender of the Faith, is one big long dilemma. Nathaniel Hawthorne, Roger Malvin's Burial, very underrated, another magnificent story. It's also about transgression. And those are sort of tight one plot element explorations and wonderful stories if you want to see how that's done. The first two episodes of Row Rights are stories on my channel. If you're familiar with those stories, those are two stories that follow that model of a simple ideal, one primary plot element. The First Man About the Stranger and Lost on Port Cullen was a quest narrative, short story quest narrative. Here we're talking about a structure that I like to call a handoff, where you have two of these, and probably not more than two of these for the reasons we talked about with the novel. You don't have a lot of room to over-explore in a short story, and what you're doing is you're trying to grab the reader's attention with the promise of that first plot element, with that introduced plot element, and maybe you resolve it, or maybe in the course of resolving that first plot element, you introduce something that's more magnetic, hence why we might call it the handoff. So a couple of stories that come to mind for me that I really, and I really love all three of these stories, and they're just magnificent short stories that do this. First one that comes to mind for me is Anthony Doerr's Shell Collector. If you're listening to these craft talks, you'll probably get tired of hearing me say, this is an amazing short story. You should go read this, but you should go read this. The Shell Collector by Anthony Doerr. Heidi Julevitz, Mary the One Who Gets There First. I love that story. It's very creative, very unique. Yeah, you should go read that one too. And then Lauren Groff's Delicate Edible Birds, which is another one where there's a, a handoff. And that one specifically goes from sort of a danger and violence narrative into a dilemma narrative that also includes some danger and violence as well. That one's pretty dark, but it's also a magnificent short story. Okay, so let's talk about the vault now, after I've gone on a 10-minute diatribe about plot structure. So this story is about a bunch of weird, mystical, I guess you could call them transhuman defenders of humanity who are extremely long-lived and undergo a process of conversion into quasi-immortal, genetically immortal beings who also deal with some side effects of that immortality that will come back later to haunt both them and Verona's creation here in this story. And this is the first story in which Verona and Clema Bali meet. So at the time, I did have an idea that they would meet again at some point, I didn't have those stories written yet or even conceived of yet, but I had a sense that, yeah, these two are going to meet again. Anyway, let's talk about the first half. So a dilemma is a conflict of a character's internal worlds. And we're going to throw this up in a diagram, which this diagram, I think, represents this story pretty well, the hourglass. And the general structure of a dilemma is going to be the conflict of two of a character's two internal worlds. And you can find more, out more about the structure of a dilemma in the lesson that's specifically on dilemmas. Lesson 11, possible worlds, dilemma, and conflict. But basically what you're doing is bringing two 
facets of a character's personality or being into conflict, usually their obligation world and their wish world. So they have one obligation to something, but they also have a wish that conflicts with that. So this first dilemma, I think, is pretty neat or tidy, clean, we should say. I don't know. It's simple. The two things that are in conflict are Verona's obligation to stay true to the vows of her order and to tell the truth and to identify threats to their weird little order and the vault. And that comes into conflict with her desire to be an accepted member of this little tribe, which she's a part of, to be obedient to her superiors, to fit in with her peers, all of those things. And they come into conflict when she realizes Edis Ali has made a mistake. And of course, Edis Ali can't make mistakes and everybody else swears that he didn't make a mistake, even though they all know that he did. People are willing to lie to themselves and others to gain social acceptance. We certainly know about this in modern times. And we also know about the consequences of when we step out of line, socially speaking. So Verona takes a large risk here. She's sort of the new kid and everyone senior to her sort of stacks up against her, including the most powerful person in the vault, Edis Ali, or well, person, the most powerful entity in the vault, Edis Ali. So the entirety of the power structure is against her. And her dilemma is, do I stay true to what I know to be true? And in the, in the first half of this story, the case of the, you know, simple ideal dilemma, this is a much cleaner narrative. There's much less gray area here. Verona's either going to be right or wrong, or do the right thing or do the wrong thing. And probably for most readers or listeners, I think she does. The only real question here is, is she going to stay true to her beliefs? It seems like a right versus wrong morality tale framework. And I would say that's true almost to the extent that giving in might represent a transgression that would have to be punished somehow in the narrative. And so that's the structure of the first dilemma. Now the handoff comes once Verona clears that hurdle. She passes that test. The structure of it is pretty pretty clean in that you have the revelation that Ali is glitching and the constraints on that are Verona brings it up. She gets told not to bring it up. It happens again. She gets told it's not happening again. And so you have those constraints tightening and tightening and tightening until Edis Ali continues to glitch to the point that there's sort of a, a showdown between Verona and everybody else. And Edis Ali glitches so badly that he goes into some kind of catatonic state. So that dilemma gets totally resolved there. The handoff happens when these commandos enter the vault and they have the opportunity to, to enter the vault because when Edis Ali begins to glitch, the acolytes in the vault call out for help and that reveals their position. And these folks were outside waiting for this to happen. They knew this was going to happen. And so they come into the vault and things get chaotic. And here's the part in the story where I, as a writer, have a big question mark because there's an incident of sudden violence that seems shocking, I think, in contrast to the simple and seemingly innocent nature of that first plot element in the handoff. And I was kind of concerned about that at the time. And of course, I don't have any editors or pre-readers or anything like that. So I was just going to put this story out on the internet and see how people reacted. I thought I would get away with it because I think it's necessary and seems to have a purpose in the story. You understand that immediately things have changed here. There's a very different dynamic and that threat of violence plays an important role in the second dilemma. I think it's important when you're using an instrument like violence to carry the suspense in the story and pull the reader into the story that it be done in a way that respects the reader. I sort of have a mantra of the three things that you need to respect as a writer or you should respect as a writer. Uh, the first is the reader. You sort of respect their time and importantly in this case their emotions. I don't think it's a great move to shock somebody just for the sake of grabbing their attention, especially if it might disturb people. I don't think you want to disturb people 
in order to capture them or anger them or upset them without it being critical to the narrative that you're trying to tell, which should be deeper than just the action taking place on the page. And this, I think, is a personal philosophy, not necessarily like this is good storytelling and that's not good storytelling. That's I think that's more about my aesthetic. You know, it may not be right for other writers out there, uh, but I think it's right for me. Second thing I always want to respect are, are the characters. And I do that by treating them as though they were real people, by doing everything I can to understand their perspective or think from their perspective and treat that seriously. And then the third thing that I will always want to respect is the form and the storytelling forms. And I think this is part of what we're dealing with respecting the reader here is like understanding that you're introducing an element that may upset them or may ruffle feathers or whatever it is and wrestling with the idea of does that introduction of that manner of executing the, the handoff here, I guess pun somewhat intended, does that work within the structure of the larger narrative? And I think that seems to have been the case if the success of the story so far on the channel uh, and the comments are an indication. I think it bears that out. Oh, I have something in my notes for this. <laughs> yeah, with respect to following the forms, in Lesson 32, I talk about schema and scripts. And people have in their minds certain scripts. And part of the deal with respecting the forms are respecting scripts that people have in their mind. So structures that they, story structures that people know well and respect. And a good example of this is a transgression. Almost always, with very few exceptions, transgression in a narrative gets punished. And readers and listeners, moviegoers, tend to get upset, they definitely notice when somebody gets away with something. When a, a character, especially if it's villainous, somebody totally gets away with doing something that's a transgression, especially uh, toward a protagonist that the reader likes, they're going to notice it. And that's because they're familiar with that script. Transgression, constraints in between, and then punishment. Okay, so let's talk about the second dilemma here. So there's a big contrast with the clarity of the first dilemma. Verona's certainty in that first dilemma sort of reflects the simplicity of this situation. You know, she says, I am who I believed myself to be, uh, which is easy enough and fair enough when you don't have a knife to your throat. And the second dilemma, which we should lay out here, so she has an obligation to, say, to stay true to the vows of her order, which definitely do not involve initiating someone or making somebody an outsider who's not in the order immortal. So they're protecting the technology of immortality. So she, her obligation here, if she's going to stay true to the interpretation of her vows, it would be to deny these intruders access to this immortality technology and and not send them into the pool uh, and if she sends them into the pool to make sure they don't get out of the pool to terrorize the galaxy for the next thousand years of course her wish world is conflicted with she also wants to stay alive right she's an immortal and though part of that deal is that she's less of a prisoner to her emotions than an ordinary human being is less a creature of emotion Maybe it's fair to say, but she also, when you take that vow to be immortal, it kind of takes a big fear off the table for someone who is maybe not a traditional human being anymore, but is still human. So anyway, her, her wish here is to, that she not die and that her fellow acolytes not die at the hands of these terrorists. The other part of Verona's wish world here, beyond the simple desire to stay alive herself and for her colleagues to stay alive, would be to, I think in this case, test the ideas that she's dedicated her life to. Especially as she's at a unique point when these commandos come into the vault of doubting. You know, if Edis Ali can be fallible, then what about the rest of our framework? And then the other element, I think she is testing here with a Bali is, which is also interesting uh, as a young acolyte, newly immortal, is what sort of human relationships can I develop now? 
And what about him if I let him go out? I think there's a curiosity there with this second wish of, do I let Abali out into the world? So things get messy. Abali states, there's, your vows don't mean anything until there's something at stake, until you have that knife to your throat. So Verona's life is on the line here, and the life of her colleagues is on the line there in the form of the gas that's in the agora. And Abali says as much by stating that it's foolish to risk the lives of all these protectors of humanity over her simple little vow, right? And suddenly for Verona, that certainty of I am who I thought myself to be is challenged by the very first time she gets put into a real world situation as an acolyte. The other part of this dilemma is the question of the morality of subjecting Abali and his uncle to this procedure because she could help them along the way to death by giving them the wrong thing. But it's also possible that they could just die anyway because this is a difficult procedure to go through, especially without preparation. So it's a little murky there too. Another issue here is that Verona knows that she's creating a monster. Uh, She says so in maybe not exactly explicit terms, but she does know explicitly from experience that he's going to be unhuman in ways that he can't possibly understand or control without guidance from the sect. So she understands that if she does this, she's going to be unleashing a beast. And because of that, it's very clear that he doesn't understand what he's asking Verona to do to him. And the uncle doesn't either. He asks for immortality and she corrects him. And then he only ever comes to realize that she was being forthright about this after the process is over and he's already lost his humanity, so to speak, that she'd been deadly serious about the transformation and he's not going to really ever be able to love again. Verona had a number of ways she could have hedged this situation here. I mean, she could have sabotaged him, made no effort to prepare him, made no effort to name him earnestly, offered no moral support at the side of the pool or empty sort of vacant moral support. But she has a sincere effort here to convert him. There's genuine pathos there. And there's also a genuine connection between the two. There's a sort of a strange attraction between these two that isn't a love attraction for Verona because that possibility is off the table. But he definitely has a pull towards her that suddenly goes off the table. But even so, there's still a pull between these two that's sort of unspoken and unexplored in this story, but is sort of an ongoing thing. So we take Verona and the narrator at their word that Verona can't feel a connection to him except as sort of an abstraction, as a kind of physical idea that services humanity. Then I think her motivation for releasing a Bali to the greater universe would be to test the ideas that he's presenting his sort of philosophy that runs starkly in contrast to the sect. This contrast is sort of a living challenge to the sect's major premise that humans can't have this technology, that he's out there living with it in his body without the centuries of preconditioning and structure of the order to rein him in, which I think is an interesting thought. So yeah, when he comes out of the pool, and sort of realizes what's happened to him and what she's done to him because there's some deliberate thought there. It's not just a, yeah, maybe I'll do this because the gun is to my head. There's kind of a weird two-way Stockholm syndrome encounter where he's incredibly vulnerable, weaponless, naked, putting his life in her hands. She's vulnerable and isn't attracted to him, but like there's clearly that unspoken connection there. And I think that part of that unspoken tension there is what I think makes the story compelling. So I think what works with this particular handoff, if I had to nail down one thing or put my finger on one thing, it's that the simplicity of the first dilemma in contrast with the complexity of the second dilemma sort of mirrors life. 
you know, here's your, your schoolroom dilemma, which literally takes place in a schoolroom or a classroom, and then the life dilemma, which literally takes place at the pool of immortality. So you can see the simplicity of a real straightforward problem and how that can confound us and set us against each other. And then a genuinely difficult problem presents itself where you can't even really wrap your head around the, the nature of the problem. So of course we know how Verona acts and the choices she makes and how everything fleshes out. And then suddenly Edis Ali appears again and chases Abali and the uncle out of the vault and they have a moment, Edis Ali and Verona, after this dilemma. She doesn't view it as a failure, which you might think that she would from the first dilemma, that I am who I am, I know who I am, I, I was the person I thought myself to be. She doesn't exactly say that again, but in this case, in the case of the second dilemma, she doesn't express any regret. She knows full well that she's unleashed this monster, and she can't explain why she did it, but she also doesn't regret it. And now she mentions that she's seeing the galaxy for the first time on Edis Ali's scale. Okay, so we had a multi-layered, many-tentacled second dilemma after the handoff from the first dilemma. And this one sort of mirrors the, you know, Pandora's box opening, releasing new tech into the world and new ideas into the world. It also focuses on the futility of our best laid plans. You know, who do we think we are? And then the world shows us that or we don't really know who we are until we're there in those moments. Then we get to find out who we are and reckon with it. Fun stuff. Okay, so that's the the handoff and the vault. So all of that is probably way more than I ever should have said about the vault. If you're still listening, I appreciate you. And hopefully this has been useful in some way. I have no idea how or to what extent this would be useful to other writers. I guess I'm just being hopeful that it is. So let me know if you're, if you're still here, still listening, and you enjoyed this. Leave me a comment. Let me know what you think. Also, I'm going to do a couple more of these. I'd like to do one for Mouse uh, later on this month. So look for that one to be coming soon. We're going to talk about power with that story. Power as a magnetic plot element. And then I have a request to do a love story or a romance story. And we're going to be doing that one at some point eventually. And it's totally my intention to not have the gap between these talks be eight months <laughs> like this one was so i'll do my best to get one of those out fairly soon but writing fiction comes first so anyway look for more content on this channel and uh, join me over at the pe row youtube channel for a weekly sci-fi story thanks for listening and we'll see you next time